of Utah in Salt Lake City. Rivers will be accompanied by Dave Holland on bass and Barry Altschul on drums as we listen to the opening soprano saxophone section of this trio concert. Sam Rivers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sam Rivers on soprano sax, Dave Holland on bass, and Barry Altschul on drums, with the opening soprano sax section of an extended trio work at the University of Utah in January of 1978. Sam Rivers has been making a unique contribution to music for more than 30 years. He talks about his musical history with Michael Cascuna. Sam, what was your first instrument? My first instrument was piano. I started with, uh, with my mother. My mother and father were both musicians, and my mother taught me piano. And then after that, violin. Really? A little later, yeah. And then uh, when I got into, um, into to, uh, school, I started on the soprano saxophone, and then to the trombone, to the baritone horn. And later in college, I changed to tenor saxophone because they didn't have a tenor saxophone soloist. And since I already knew how to play it, I, I jumped onto that one. What made you get uh, into the soprano saxophone? It seems like uh, that would have been a period of time when there wasn't much happening on the instrument. Well, it was used. Uh, it was used. Um, yeah, it was. I guess simpler than the than the clarinet. You know, to start playing right away into the band. It took me about a month, and I was uh, sort of playing the. Uh, since you know, a musician changing instruments is not a problem for him to learn another instrument unless it's a really highly technical instrument like the violin. But the other instruments, I mean, he, he can uh, get pretty fast out uh, fairly quickly since he already knows music and knows how to go about studying an instrument. So I had already been, I could play f very well when I was, you know, fairly young on piano, so I was pretty well into music. So going to another instrument that was much simpler than the piano, you know, wasn't yeah. any problem at all. And you stayed on tenor, once you hit the tenor, you stayed on tenor for, yeah, to I begin stayed, your professional life. Yeah, and when I was in college, I changed the tenor. That was, I was about 16, I think. And I changed the tenor as a permanent thing. I was, you know, I haven't touched the trombone in so many years, you know. But I stayed on tenor. I just thought it's much easier to express yourself on a saxophone. As a matter of fact, saxophone is the, more or less the main jazz instrument as far as the wail, or rec, you know, the paralleling the voice in a sense you know, for, the, for, the, for the sounds that it can do and uh, so I'm I sort of stayed with that it fit me well mm -hmm. from the late 40s to the early 60s Rivers based himself in Boston working with Herb Pomeroy and Jackie Byatt and big bands and with his own groups including in the process a modern improvisational ensemble which explored new ways to use European compositional techniques he also composed, arranged, and conducted music for various plays, several of which were presented in off-Broadway theaters. Sam would go on the road occasionally, most notably with Tad Dameron, T-Bone Walker, and even as the musical director for Wilson Pickett. His close relationship with the young drummer in his group, Tony Williams, led to his eventual migration to New York City in 1964. Meanwhile, Tony had left and come to New York uh, with Jackie McLean with the connection and that's when Miles heard him and he, Miles uh, took him right in and then My, uh, Tony played uh, Miles one of the tapes and sent me a telegram out there and uh, so was I um, Michigan someplace one of those small cities in Michigan we were, were and so I just came right back and joined Miles' group we went we went to Philly and then we came into Birdland you know and then went on tour to to, to Japan, and um, then you know that was my uh, that was the beginning of my experiences in New York because I moved to New York at that time. And the reason why I moved wasn't so much as because because I was with Miles because I could have stayed anywhere and been with Miles because I wanted to come here. I had a lot of music already written, you know, and I wanted to you know come here where the musicians were available that could you know interpret and play the music that I had written here. With Miles, you were you were only on uh, one album, uh, Live in Tokyo, yeah. and then um, <clears throat> I guess it was at the end of that summer Wayne Shorter came into the band. Right. What happened? Well, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, well, what happened was I went out with Andrew Hill, you know, and uh, and so uh, when they got ready to go out, you know, that uh, Wayne went in. But I'm 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 pretty sure that. Uh, Miles wanted Wayne anyway, you know, because but my, Wayne was with uh, Art Blakey at the time, right? And so that was uh, I was supposed to have gone with Art Blakey, but I, instead I went. It was supposed to be a switch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Word, I went out with uh, Andrew Hill instead, man. Did you enjoy the experience with Miles? I know that was a time when he was still playing a lot of his old repertoire and stuff. Yeah, it was, it was, he was playing you know, a lot of it. And then, so it was a very, you know, it was a very beautiful experience for me. You know, I enjoyed every minute of it, you know. And to be standing next to Miles, you know, every night listening to him was really something. Mm. You, know. you started to suddenly, after that, um, pop up on a lot of uh, Blue Note dates by Bobby Hutcherson or, or Larry Young and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tony Williams, mm -hmm. and then uh, suddenly made your first album, which is a masterpiece, which is not an easy thing to do on your first album, mm -hmm. Fuchsia Swing Song. Mm -hmm. How did all that uh, getting in that whole Blue Note family come about? Well, it came about through uh, Act Tony because um, Alfred Lyons okay. was the uh, the um, owner of uh, Blue Note at that time, and also the main producer wanted Tony to do some albums because he was in getting into uh, more or less the the avant-garde, you know, he had done some records with uh, Arnett and he'd done some records with Cecil. And we did the record with Tony and he was very pleased with that and he offered me a contract right after, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it happened. That's how I made all those uh, Blue Note records and the last one was the one, the uh, Involution, right. which was in the can for so many years. Once established in New York City, Sam Rivers began to initiate new musical projects. One project was the creation of a performing art space in a loft called Studio Rivby, which he founded in 1970. Unlike most of the New York venues of this period, Studio Rivby provided a forum for the younger emerging musicians who were experimenting in newer musical approaches. It was a major center for the presentation of new music until 1977, by which time Sam felt it had accomplished what it set out to do. With his background as a leader of the Loft Jazz Movement, it's appropriate that we listen to the Sam Rivers Quartet in the Loft-like setting of the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. This was a part of the 1979 Jazz and Heritage Festival. We'll hear Sam with Joe Daly on tuba, Dave Holland on bass, and Bobby Battle on drums. Notice how Sam carries his musical invention from one instrument to another, first on piano, then to the tenor saxophone, and finally to the flute. The Sam Rivers Quartet. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bobby Battle on drum. Joe Daly, tuba, baritone horn, and euphonium. Thank you. David Holland. Hey. I'm Sam Rivers. Thank you. The Sam Rivers Quartet from the New Orleans Contemporary Arts Center in April of 1979. River's system of creating music has gone through a long evolution. Again, Michael Kaskuna. You also work with, um, with Andrew Hale and with McCoy Tyner and with Cecil Taylor as well as Miles Davis. And I was wondering how uh, each of those experiences helped to, to shape your musical conceptions. Mm. I know they're four very different people. Yeah. Um, well, it's hard to say. I mean, everything would probably probably be um, in a way, I mean, going into the subconscious. Um, I, Cecil Taylor, I guess, was, was uh, as, as far as his, his concept about uh, music, I guess, was probably the most dominant one, you know. And in what we, way? Well, we rehearsed, I mean, we would rehearse for six and seven hours straight, you know, and I had never done that before, you know. And uh, so, I mean, it's a different experience when you get into the fifth hour or so, you know, I mean, you really pretty much open up. It's, you know, it gets to be very, very spiritual because it's in the kind, you get yourself into a kind of a trance, you see. And, you know, it can only happen, I mean, after, uh, you know, like, like a length of time and, you know, like a, con a length of time in concentration and it becomes no longer concentration, it becomes like purely spiritual and everything comes out as more or less just coming straight through you in a flow like that where, I mean, it becomes totally, I mean, uh, out of, uh, an out-of-body kind of feeling, you know. Now we're into some kind of music that's uh, much more profound than playing for five minutes. Because if you play 45 minutes, I mean, you have to have uh, experience and creativity, you know, to stand up and be able to create, you know, like, yeah. for, you know, for 45 minutes, I'm saying. You mm -hmm. know? But if we go on for an hour and a half and two and three hours, you know, and you keep finding new things to do as you're going, you know, and... And it's, it's, it's really opened me up. When you play with the, uh, well, currently quartet, what used mm -hmm. to be your trio for, oh, I guess about the last six years, is there any preconceived motifs or any uh, preconceived setup as to where the music's going to go? No, there isn't. There's no planning at all, and, and we've been doing this for quite a while, so... D did you have a hard time convincing Sidemen to take that risk and go out there naked and do that? Well, um... Yeah, <laughs> I did, you know, for, for them, you know, but at the beginning, I mean, we would talk, you know, we would play and we would talk, you know, then I would say, you know, I'm, you know, talk about the mood change. That's about it when we first started, you know. Like I say now, it's, uh, it's so more or less like a, uh, a unit in, a, in the sense that, uh, that I don't, I'm not, on, I'm not, you know, like solely responsible for the change of direction anymore because you know like they can change they change direction too see so, and see there can be no weak weak links in yeah. this you see and, and that's it's so once i'm able to find a few you know a few musicians that are really in empathy you know so it's we stay together you see there's no real change and so i've had to say i keep the same musicians with me year in and year out yeah but i would imagine the the greatest difficulty, and I was curious as to how uh, everyone deals with themselves mentally, at least at first, is um, not just avoiding cliches of of music that's embedded in your head since childhood, but also uh, avoiding the cliches that you've created and mm -hmm. tended to repeat as a as yeah. an individual musician. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you clear your head? Do you have to work consciously to avoid? Uh, falling into uh, your own cliches or other people's cliches? Well, um, I'm, I don't uh, really try to avoid them. I mean, you know, I just go through them and I recognize it and then it doesn't happen again, you know. I mean, I think that's, that's, uh, that's the um, <clears throat> advantage of, 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 of long choruses, you know, because you work out of your cliches, you see. If you're taking uh, two choruses, that's all you're doing. 
It's playing with cliches. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, any any saxophone, any soloist that jumps up and has two choruses in the band, you know, he just, you know, he doesn't have time to develop anything. Yeah. So there it is. He gets he plays with cliches. And, mm -hmm. you know. So of course there are times when, when I feel that I'm not really, you know, that I just can't find anything that that really seems to like work you know mm -hmm. Every, everyone else i mean is working but i mean so i mean it i have you know i have periods of uh you know where i have uh, of depression in a sense where i mean I, I feel like i'm bogged down in a rut you know mm -hmm. that happens you know but um it's uh of course i recognize now after all these years of playing you know that there are certain stages that you go through you don't stay in the same place you know mm -hmm. and if you feel like bogged down you know then the best thing to do is to keep working harder because you're on your way to the next plateau Sam Rivers. I'm Billy Taylor. Jazz Alive will continue with the world of Sam Rivers, including quartet and orchestra performances, after this pause for station identification. This is NPR, National Public Radio. From American University, 88.5 FM, WAMU, Washington. Welcome back to Jazz Alive and the music of Sam Rivers. The performance that we're about to hear with Sam's quartet is a perfect illustration of the group's ability to spontaneously weave melodies, rhythms, and textures that flow and evolve. Listen as Sam's tenor saxophone develops into a duet with Joe Daly's tuba. Then Dave Holland underscores the duet with a sensitively bowed bass. Thurman Barker follows with a mallet pattern on the drums. The focus and the sounds shift so logically and beautifully that the music appears carefully composed. From the Armadillo World Headquarters in Austin, Texas, the Sam Rivers Quartet. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Sam Rivers, Joe Daly, Dave Holland, and Thurman Barker from Austin, Texas in October of 1978. A truly spellbinding, totally improvised creation by the Sam Rivers Quartet. Sam's small ensemble has been playing regularly around the world in large and small towns. Their popularity is due not only to the quality of their music, but also the experience that the audience receives from witnessing the group's creative process. Even though most of his small group's music is improvisational, there's a compositional side to Sam Rivers. It began when he started with Alan Havanis at the Boston Conservatory. You, in 1972 or three, m made an album called uh, Crystals that mm -hmm. included the orchestral music that you'd written, oh, I guess, over the 20 years leading up to that. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that with uh, you had a big band with Joe Gordon and, and, and Jackie Byron that you yeah. had been writing for in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you first get into composition, into, uh, excuse me, into, you know, uh, orchestral composition? And what has uh, been your, your general approach? I guess it's evolved over the years, mm -hmm. but... Well, I was a little, just a little before I went into the conservatory. And then I went in and I was, uh, uh, really got into it then because I was studying orchestration and, you know, and that was part of it. And I was looking at the orchestration of, uh, you know, the European composers, you know. And, uh, I guess my main, you know, like, main influence was, like, the size of the band, of the orchestra, the jazz orchestras, like Count Basie and Duke. <coughs> and, and, um, you know, I'd seen every, all, all the bands when I was young, Andy Kirk, you know. But it wasn't so much, uh, you know, I wasn't really, you know, I, I heard something else with the, <coughs> with the big band other than what they were doing at that, at that time, you know. I did a, one of my first arrangements was when I was about 19, was on All Too Soon. And it had a lot, you know, it was pretty much, I mean, the same style that I'm going in now, where it had, a, it was built, you know, based on the changes of All Too Soon, but it had a lot of lines going, a lot of melodic lines going like that. And so I, I always thought in terms of that rather than in terms of, like, chords, you know, and, and playing in, in, in chords or or like the... Voicing way, a song. Yeah, yeah, the voicings, the way they do it. You know, I, I was thinking more or less in, in terms of trying to have the voicings there, of course, but uh, the horns, as they were going melodically, reach a certain point and these voicings happen. And the voicings would be there, but the, the melodic line leads into the voicings. What I'm trying to... Each line, each, each horn, a lot of horns would have different lines going, you know, but they would match the more or less the, the chords mm -hmm. and 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 they would be into the voicings too of course i use a lot of block chords too but my main emphasis is on like a lot of lines melodic lines going at the same time and so i pretty much i mean tried to you know build on that that particular theme of course i think that duke ellington was about you know the closest that uh and, and mingus you know mm -hmm. in, in listening to it where I think that my music differs is it's, it's not based on any harmonic foundation, you see. There's no chord structure at all. I mean, there's, you know, there's lines and, and uh, of course, I mean, the way, the way I'm writing, I'm, I know when I, what, you know, like the intervals and everything like that, but I'm not thinking in terms of a basic chord. I'm thinking in terms of, of colors and the clusters 
and uh, you know, like a lot of lines going. And uh, I've been doing, you know, doing scores for so long. Now. I mean, I can look at a score and tell how it sounds. You see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know, I was sort of, uh, 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 at that point, you know, so <clears throat> so I don't really need it. So I mean, I really don't need to have it played for my benefit. Because right. <laughs> I have, uh, I have at least. Um, with no exaggeration, I have 50 compositions ready that I haven't heard that are written and ready to be performed, you see. <laughs> and they're right there, you know. And and uh, as I mentioned about the one we did, you know, that was only part one, you know. The whole thing is written, you see. Hmm. And, uh, and that's a, the, the one on this program, that's a, a, a four-part suite, and we're hearing just the first part. Just the first part. Hmm. And then the first part, and the, the whole four-part suite is broken down into... It can be broken down into ensembles. It's written for 30, 30, 30 musicians. Uh, 15 reeds, uh, no, excuse me, 10 reeds, 13 brass, four strings, and two drum sets who double on percussion. Now, the, the, the 10 reeds can take and go out and do a concert completely by themselves with it, you know. Or the 15, 13 brass can do that same thing. Or it can be a string quartet with two cellos and two basses. Or it can be a drum uh, duo with just two drum sets. And it, or you can put it together like I did and, and have an orchestra piece. So it was written like that. I noticed the uh, solo structure on the tunes uh, on, on, on this suite, the first part of the suite, seems seemed to have been uh, uh, a soloist starting out and then being joined by another soloist making it an mm -hmm. improvisational duet. Sure. Uh, and that seems to go uh, with different pairings throughout the piece. Yeah. W were, was there any um, instruction or any talking or, or any uh, concept given to the soloists? No. No, none whatsoever. Just they knew when, when, when they were supposed to, I mean, at what part they were supposed to improvise. And uh, that was it. No, I'm, so the, the soloist is always open. I mean, so, I mean, he, he plays what he feels, I mean, should be appropriate for that particular minute, you know. And, um, and I thought it was all beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really couldn't direct it. Of course, you see, I mean, the, um, of these, you know, of that composition, it's not, I have, uh, it's in my favor that they haven't been, uh, in a sense, recorded yet because I'm always, I mean, perfecting them, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, after this performance, which was the first one, now I hear a lot of things that need to be done to it that I'm going to put it back. I remember what needs to be done, and I'll do that too. And now, from the Public Theater in New York City, Sam Rivers and his 30-piece orchestra with an excerpt from his orchestral suite.
Thank you. Thank you very much. The Sam Rivers Orchestra. The Sam Rivers. Jimmy Voss. John Stubblefield. Hammett Blewett. Ron Bridgewater. Lee Rossi. Bill Cody. James Ware. James Stewart. Steve Coleman and John Purcell on reeds. Jack Walroth, Oliver Beener, Ted Daniel, Frank Gordon on trumpets. Ray Anderson, George Lewis, Charles Steffens, and Richard Harper on trombones. Vincent Chauncey, John Clark, and Greg Williams on French horns. Abdul Wadud, Pat Dixon, and Monier Abdul Fattah on cellos. Joe Daly, and Bob Stewart on tubas, Dave Holland on bass, Thurman Barker and Warren Smith on percussion, the Sam Rivers Orchestra from the Public Theater in New York City. <laughs> 